Thank you, Mr. President. And I appreciate the, the points that have been made, made by my, my colleagues from Ohio and Pennsylvania and the remarks yet to be made by my colleague from Rhode Island. Uh, we're here on the floor together to raise fundamental issues that should be part of the discussion about a proposed trade deal or a fast track to a trade deal. Now, I love the concept of trade, the idea that uh, our particular economy, based on our natural resources and based on our, our skills, produce certain things very, very well, and we would like to be able to take and sell those products to the world, and that other nations do other things very well, and we can benefit by their expertise and import those products. That's a win-win on a level playing field between nations that have roughly the same structure of environmental laws roughly the same structure of labor laws, roughly the same level of wages. That's a win-win for, for both nations or multiple nations involved in an agreement. And indeed, our trade agreements after World War II were very much in that, in that line. As we expanded to the economies of, of Europe, uh, we saw substantial prosperity. And we saw prosperity uh, that affected people just throughout our economy. Uh, my parents couldn't believe the difference between their experience as children and their experience uh, during the 1950s and 60s as they started to raise children in terms of going from extraordinarily humble means, uh, lack of electricity and running water and insulation and all the things that became part of the basic housing structure post-World War II, the environment they were able to raise their children. That prosperity was from a nation producing things and sharing the wealth throughout its economy. My father, as a, as a working man, as a blue-collar mechanic, he brought those mechanical skills to the mill, became a millwright, loved that job, keeping the machinery in the mill running, loved other jobs. He was able to live the American dream. But our recent trade deals have created something quite different. They've been based on an unequal relationship. They've been based on a relationship between our nation with strong environmental and labor laws and good wages and high enforcement and the exact opposite in other countries, like China, for example. And indeed, the result of the period since NAFTA, and my colleagues spoke to it, but let me reemphasize it, a loss of 50,000 factories, a loss of 5 million manufacturing workers. That is logical. If you are a company and you are making things, then you are going to move that manufacturing to the places cheapest to make things. Now, this is how the vision works out. There's a conversation about reducing barriers, and companies say, look at all the additional amount we can sell to, say, that emerging economy in China. We can make a lot more in the US and sell it to China. That's stage one. Stage two is, oh, hey, now we can move our manufacturing overseas and produce things at a much lower price, not only sell them to the foreign nation, but also sell them back to the customers in the United States. And that's exactly what we've seen, and that's why we've lost these five million, million jobs. So the initial publicity campaign is all about creating jobs through increasing American manufacturing. But the reality and an unequal relationship is the opposite. Let us make sure that we create a standard for the consideration of future trade deals, a standard that is whether this deal will create good paying jobs here in America, will expand prosperity to the middle class in America, or will it do the opposite? That's the standard we should bring and apply. Well now, I'd like to evaluate the provisions of the proposed deal in that light, but I can't, because the negotiations are secret. The draft text is secret. But we need to demand that there not be secrecy about something as important as creating jobs in America or destroying jobs in America. But that will be my standard for evaluating what is to come. And let's talk for a minute about the, the rosy promises on enforcement. 
A couple years ago, a group of 10 U.S. senators uh, took a trip to China, and we were meeting with the ambassador, and we were asking how he felt about enforcement against China of their currency manipulation. And he basically said, here's the deal. We have broad strategic concerns that involve China, and we don't want to put ripples in the water. Well, so can you really have a level playing field in a situation where you're, you're not willing to enforce even the provisions that are on the books? Can you really have a fair deal for America? Now, during the conversations a couple years ago, I proposed a, a bill, legislation, that would require China to actually honor what it was responsible for doing under, under the WTO. Under the WTO, it's supposed to notify Americans about all the subsidies it provides for items of export, deductions and credits, but China had not honored that responsibility. So I propose that we exercise another part of WTO, which was counter notifications by our trade representative. And within two weeks of putting this idea forward, guess what? Our trade representative put forward a list of 200 subsidies through the counter notification process. And if you look at those things carefully, you could see a vast strategy in renewable energy to subsidize exports, not allowed under the WTO, to subsidize paper, not allowed to subsidize exports of paper in the WTO. And what is the result? Paper plant after paper plant going out of business in the United States of America. The Blue Heron plant most recently went out of business on the Willamette River at a place where paper has been made for a very long period of time. And it, in fact, it was first the energy from that from the uh, uh, water wheel that was first there was provided some of the first electricity in America. Long time industrial production, but those jobs are gone. So that is a real concern. And my colleague mentioned the interstate dispute settlement and the fact that it gives a foreign investor rights that a domestic investor does not have. It puts constraints on consumer protection that can be overrun. Consumer protection that is done by a state or by a nation can be overrun by an investor from a foreign nation. You have, for example, a bill on America to stop producing toxic flame retardants and putting them into our carpets. Well, the foreign investor says, we build a plant to produce that chemical. Sorry, you can't have that consumer protection, even though the result will be a lot more cancer for American citizens. That's an example of the concerns about handing over the sovereignty of our nation over consumer laws, over environmental laws, to an independent board that operates outside of our constitutional framework. That's a legitimate concern that needs to be addressed in this conversation. So from issues of enforcement and issues of secrecy, issues of whether we're creating jobs or destroying jobs, I encourage Americans to become as familiar as possible with the provisions that have been leaked about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and to think carefully and, and give concerns to us here in Congress that we will work to address. When we have the, the, the legitimate text before us, then we can engage in a more detailed debate. But right now, we need to push to end this secrecy on an issue so important to the future prosperity of our nation and of our families.